From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. Welcome back once more to the Cannabis Podcast. If this is your first time visiting us, well, and especially warm welcome. Over the next 30 minutes or so, we just got a ton of information about the plant I love, cannabis. And I hope you're going to enjoy the ride. Today, we've got some interesting things to talk about. It's going to be three years this October 17th since legalization occurred in Canada. And there is a lot of talk about that change. In fact, I have a couple of stories on that topic today. I also have an interview with Daniel Lorette out of New Brunswick. Daniel has created an app to help us all grow some better cannabis. It's called GrowDoc, and we'll talk about that. On Cultivar Corner, another trip to the East Coast for Gaelic Fire from Highland Grow. We have some listener comments that open up a discussion on medicinal versus recreational. And we'll finish with a flashback story to when I had to take my wife to the hospital years ago in Nelson because she couldn't stop giggling. All of that and more on episode 68 of the Cannabis Podcast. And let's take care of a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the stories for today. A couple of shout-outs. A shout-out to Jim. Jim, who's from Vancouver. James, also a couple of shout-outs to him because he's contacted me a couple of times and has had some great suggestions for topics. We'll talk about that. Jim is from, or James is from Ontario, I believe. And also want to send out a shout-out to someone nicknamed Uncle Buck. Mark is his name, and Mark contacted me as well, listening to the podcast, and is another one who has offered to send me some weed. We'll see if that develops any further. So I want to thank you all for your great topics and some comments. And specifically, James is the one who raised the whole idea of recreational versus medicinal. And I thought the questions he raised were really cool ones. And in a follow-up, he actually answered some of his own questions uh, by what he has done in the last week or so. So here are some of the things that he brought up for a discussion point regarding medical marijuana versus recreational. What's the difference? Is it harvested differently? Are there special strains that are for medical only? Does Canada still have medical dispensaries now that cannabis is legal? And that is an entirely different discussion. Perhaps I'll rant on that one day. Can a dispensary suggest a specific strain for a specific ailment? Which I thought was a really interesting question, since in a recreational cannabis store, we can make no medical recommendations. And the other question he had is, if he can order cannabis from Shoppers Drug Mart, is it considered a dispensary? And what makes a store a dispensary? All some great questions, Jim, or James, or however you would like to be referred to. I guess since you you signed it, Jim, I'll refer to you that way. Great questions. I don't know that I have the answers to all of those questions, but I am going to do some investigating and see if we can find out some of those questions. And uh, Jim did follow that up uh, by he actually did go to Shoppers Drug Mart. And we'll talk about that on the next episode about what his experience was there. And I had the best question in the store the other day. This was one that I, (laughs) I chuckled about it and we actually chuckled about it for most of the day. Answered the phone. And the first question I was asked was how much our ounces are. Well, I, of course, didn't give a price because we are not allowed to give prices over the phone because of the legislation, which in itself is weird. But then he followed it up with the weirdest question I have ever heard. So he asked me for the price of ounces, and then he followed that up with, what size do your ounces come in? (laughs) After a pregnant pause, my reply was, um... All of our ounces are 28 grams. I don't know what answer he was expecting there. And another thing I wanted to mention is my friend David Wiley from the Okanagan Z has uh, kind of morphed into the ounce.ca. Well, David and his partner Jenny are hosting a new podcast. It is called By the Ounce. And I'm very pleased that I was actually on as a guest for their episode seven. So give me a hit at their website, theounce.ca, if you care to listen or listen to any of their other podcasts. And on a personal note, I have to say, when you work Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, and you don't smoke any cannabis at work, it is such a treat to have the weekend arrive. You wake up on Saturday morning, and you can wake and bake. (laughs) I love being high. And because legislation is due for renewal on October 17th of this year, when we hit the three-year mark, 
A couple of stories about that. This is from CannabisRetailer.ca. The importance of the 2021 Cannabis Act review. When Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced the legalization of cannabis in 2018, a very important detail was passed over by most of the media, and that was the three-year review written into the original legislation. The government knew it was going into uncharted territory by legalizing cannabis for recreational use on a national level. Politicians knew they would face strong opposition and fear from socially conservative Canadians. But they also knew that the initial turmoil created by the legislation would settle down. So perhaps the wisest part of that legislation was ensuring that in three years, we would be in a position to review and amend the legislation once we had some experience, some empirical information and a real feel for how cannabis would influence our society and communities. October 2021 is when the legislation is slated for review and change. Some associations and working groups are already coming together to work on this important opportunity. The industry should be joining the discussion to ensure that our voice is heard by government during the legislative review. 1. Review the current state of the industry. It's hard to know where we want to go if we don't know where we've come from. And to be honest, most people have not read the Federal Cannabis Act. It's pretty dry reading as an aside. But that's okay. It's not a terribly exciting document to read, but understanding the core spirit of this legislation will help direct the wording of any changes to the original spirit of the legislation. To identify changes and improvements. Now that we have nearly three years of experience behind us, we are well equipped to write a lasting and effective piece of legislation that will allow for a strong legalized industry, reasonable regulation of product, and a projection of the strong social values that make Canada great. Since we now have experience in the industry, we're better equipped to find that reasonable balance. Number three, educate legislators. Once we identify the changes and improvements that will benefit the industry, while still allowing for the regulation of the industry, the hard work will be educating the legislators about those recommendations and the need to include them in October's review of the Cannabis Act. There's a lot going on in Ottawa, and getting the attention of Parliament on a non-emergency legislative review will be a challenge. Educating them about the long-term benefits of this sector, not just for jobs and economic benefit, but also for the safety of consumers, is very important. Ultimately, we have to remember that we're all focused on the same goal, which is the legalization of cannabis in Canada, to create safe and legal jobs for Canadians, safe product for consumers, and a sustainable industry for future generations. It's with that goal in mind that we can all work together to grow the Federal Cannabis Act into what it needs to be. And that was written by John Carl, the Executive Director of the Alberta Cannabis Council. Excellent article there, John. Thanks for sharing that with us. And there's lots of things that we need to think about in relation to the Cannabis Act in 2000, or rather after three years of legalization. We've talked about it before. One of the main ones has to be the edibles limit of 10 milligrams per package. That, if nothing else, is keeping the black market alive in edibles because there are many, many people, and we've talked about it before, that need more than that 10 milligrams of THC to feel a buzz from their edibles. So that's one of the things that has to change. Packaging has to change. The labeling has to change. The incessant need for all this labeling that, that creates so much demand for the LPs. It's so hard for them to get all that information, especially when most of it is that big yellow warning sign from our government. There's so much that needs to change. So that's one perspective on what's happening this year as we review. But here's another. This is from Yahoo Finance. And the perspective on this one is how Canada's legal pot rules could change in 2021. Health Canada wants to know how the public feels about how cannabis is sold, labeled, and researched. Industry experts expect the feedback to prompt a mild relaxation of rules for packaging and possession of infused drinks, leaving more controversial topics like advertising to a broader review of the Cannabis Act in 2021. The Federal Health Agency issued a 30-day call for the public to comment on a host of cannabis-related issues on December 11th. Now, I do not remember that happening on December 11th. <laughs> do any of you? The request is open-ended, but specifically asks for feedback on product labeling, small-scale cultivation, non-therapeutic research, and how possession limits are applied to products like drinks. The consultation comes ahead of a full review of the federal legislative framework for legal pot in Canada, set to begin no later than October 17, 2021, the three-year anniversary of recreational legalization. 
Michael Armstrong, a Brock University business professor who studies cannabis legal cannabis market, has been critical of the limited information producers are allowed to include on their packaging. Currently, labels must display THC and CBD content. Facts about other cannabinoids and terpenes are optional. Health Canada wants to know if it should require more information, and if doing so would help consumers choose the right products for their needs. Armstrong believes producers should be allowed to include a paragraph of information, similar to what appears in the back of a wine bottle, that would spell out what kind of flavor and high to expect. He said the regulator would need to ensure the messaging does not include medical claims, such as promises to improve sleep or relieve anxiety. He blames the limited information on packages for the prevailing consumer focus on simply THC content and price. And I would agree with him on that. Now, another rule Armstrong expects Health Canada to be receptive to changing is the equivalency rates for cannabis possession. The current rules allow individuals to carry up to 30 grams of dried cannabis, but only 2.1 liters of cannabis-infused beverages. The rules limit many of the canopy gross beverages to five cans per purchase, while competitors like Aurora and the Green Organic Dutchman have responded by releasing more potent shots and powders that can be bought in much greater quantities. In fact, we talked about the Green Organic Dutchman's uh, THC powder uh, a few episodes ago, and you can buy like 24 packages of that, and it doesn't even add up to a gram of equivalency. So whether you compare it to the rest of the cannabis space or you compare it to alcohol, it's a flawed concept, says Chief Executive Officer David Klein. While an equal regulatory playing field with alcohol has long been the goal of many in the industry, some doubt the regulators will allow it, given the health and societal effects of booze. Health Canada has always said that, in their opinion, alcohol policy has largely been kind of failed public policy, said Deepak Anand, Chief Executive Officer of Materia Ventures, and a longtime commenter on cannabis regulations. Some of the cannabis industry are asking for parity with alcohol, and the regulators are saying they don't want to regulate it that way. I think that's where a lot of the industry concerns and frustrations are stemming from. Health Canada's consultation notice also hinted at potential changes for microcultivators, microprocessors, and nurseries, licenses for small-scale producers. The agency wants to know if the lesser regulatory burden for these types of producers is appropriate given their scale, and if the current framework puts smaller growers at a disadvantage compared to larger peers. Interesting time we are in as we approach three years of cannabis legalization in our country. Uh, I do hope that there's a lot of changes in the legal in the legislation, and we'll see if we see start to see any of those as of October 17th this year. And our conversation today is with Daniel Lorette from New Brunswick. Daniel has created an app that is going to help us grow better cannabis this year. At least that's what we hope. It's called GrowDoc. You can find the details at growdoc.net. And I, of course, have the link back at CannabisPodcast.com for you. But we pick up the conversation with Daniel just after I welcome him to the Cannabis Podcast. First of all, I'm going to assume, Daniel, that you have uh, some interest in cannabis, not just in identifying the plants. Yeah, um, we, we, I personally, myself, I, I, I'm an advocate for cannabis. I love it, the, all the, the benefits that, that can come out of it. And uh, so now we're, we're doing the, the identification of, of diseases and we're going to we want to do pests and uh, also do the male to female. Yeah, I was taking a look at your at your site and, and uh, I'll, of course, post the link uh, back at CannabisPodcast.com and it is at GrowDoc.net. That's where you can find out all the details and, and pretty cool what, you, what you've done, Daniel. So give me a sense of where did your journey with cannabis start? Let's let's we'll talk about the app in a minute, but but where did your journey with cannabis start? Uh, my journey with cannabis, I mean, it goes back to, to high school days uh, where it's, uh, you know, it, it was a guy that traded a, a PlayStation 4 to get a quarter of, of cannabis. And then we you know, <laughs> smoked it behind the behind the mall, uh, behind the dumpster. You know, back then it was still uh, it, quite a bit illegal and getting caught was quite w- still in the in the weird zone. So since then, you know, I, I, I started growing about seven years ago and, you know, growing here and there. But lately in the last four years, I've, we've been growing steady while I've I, I, I had these issues when I first started growing and I saw that there was no solution. So when I, I saw that this tool could be created and it was already existing in other agriculture um, crops. So I was like, okay, hey, well, I, I'm going to take a take part of that to, to create this, this app. And, you know, I've been growing since to, to really try to diagnose things. And, you know, we've got 
research facilities and, and a university on board that's going to do these deficiencies so we can uh, have all this credible data added to the app. Yeah, very cool. So you have a programming background, do you? Yes, I do. Yeah, and, and, and obviously that's what sparked you. So you take your cannabis, take your programming background, you put them both together, and you come up with GrowDoc. Yeah, exactly. I was working at a tech startup, um, so I, I had extensive knowledge of how, like, I, you know, I started, uh, you know, employee four, and there was just a few clients, and it went all the way to 40 people. So I saw that whole progression, and then I saw this opportunity and, you know, this opening in the, in the cannabis industry with cannabis tech. So I was like, I, somebody's got to do it. It's got to be me. So yeah. I just went for it. Oh, good for you. I, it's really good. I'm, I'm impressed with what I what I see on the website. I'm be curious to try out the app once once the growing season starts. So, so give us a sense, Daniel. We we know you built the app, and we'll talk a little bit about you know some of the effort to get there. But let's let's get a picture of what the app does. So give me a sense of what GrowDoc does and can do for my uh, cannabis plants this year. Yeah. So GrowDoc is essentially focused on uh, identifying cannabis plant problems. So um, whether you've got you know a deficiency or underwatering and overwatering, the the app simply works by you just have to take a picture of that affected leaf and the machine learning in the background with its data set is going to be able to di- identify the problem and then give you a solution. So what we're doing, we're really narrowing down the information. We're trying to make it quick, especially really helpful for like hemp farmers or people out on the field, you know, outdoor grow, where you can just pull out the app, have a scan and then see and confirm for yourself with images and videos of this is the actual problem. And then you get your solution immediately. Okay. That is, that is very cool. So you mentioned, Daniel, that you've uh, partnered with some educational uh, organizations to to do some experimental testing. Explain to us how that's going to help the app and and what kind of testing they're doing for you. We've got, uh, it's called a CCNB, so it's the Community College of New Brunswick that's in our province, and they're a research facility. So they're helping, companies can pay to test out research, and normally it was, uh, they were working a lot with beer and beverages, but now that cannabis is legal and they have a license, they can do these these testing. Where they're located, they're in a sort of, it was agriculture for potatoes, a lot of McCain fries, it's all from there, so they're already doing these uh, the nutrient deficiency testing on the potatoes and they were doing tomatoes for us just to go there. They, they were already doing those. So we, we can get them to do the deficiencies on the cannabis plant as well. So right now we've done the potassium with them, just a small experiment. And that just finished last few, few weeks ago. We're starting up a bigger project with them in May or June, where they're going to conduct uh, nitrogen, potassium, uh, phosphorus, calcium and magnesium deficiencies. And then they're going to test out a few pathogens as well. Fusarium, white power mildew, and, and gray mold. That's for the, the research uh, at CCMB. The University of Moncton is, is a bit different. This is an actual uh, project with uh, postdoctorate students. So it's a two year. Um, they're doing the same uh, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, and then the same pathogens as well. But they're going to look more on a microbiology level. Uh, and see what's actually going on. They want to really study this. So w- they're kind of, you know, we're funding this experiment and they're piggybacking off a little bit to, to see how else, what else is going on with the plant. And then that is, is going to be a study that's going to be peer reviewed by uh, six other major universities like Guelph, uh, University of Sherbrooke. And, and th- that's going to be peer reviewed. And hopefully we, we get to get some, some more insight that we've never had. Yeah. So that's, that's the goal out of that one, yeah. Oh, that's very cool, Daniel. I'm glad to hear that you have those kind of arrangements with them. As that data gets developed, you'll be incorporating that knowledge base back back into the AI for the app, I assume? Yeah, exactly. So they're going to, like, that's the, the, the part of the experiment. They're doing the experiment, but it's they're taking pictures and videos uh, as that experiment goes on. So we're going to get to track the whole picture, like the whole uh, symptoms that the plant's going to go through from start to finish. And, you know, the early on signs, we're going to get visual data, images, the videos. So it's going to be really cool to be able to see that because, you know, from my knowledge, you know, you were just checking a few sites where it was low quality images and, uh, you know, that, that infograph chart, that's kind of what everybody's working with. So um, it's going to be cool to be able to show everybody the early signs and the late signs and to have, you know, high quality images to show that. I'm a backyard grower, and there's a number of backyard growers that are listening to this podcast. What's the benefit? What what will this app bring to my experience this year as a grower if I use your app? So for outdoor growers, like this is one thing that we're finding that the problem that people are having are all all different from the licensed producers to the hemp. Right now, we're we're targeting uh, the the outdoor growers as well as the hemp. So we're we're trying to get the the bug data to so the leaf hoppers. We've got spider mites covered a little bit, but we're going to deep a little bit deeper in that, you know, leaf miners. So what what we can do for the outdoor growers, and they, they can be confident and have the tool uh, in hand, you know, the app is free. 
um, so they could just scan and, and, and get a diagnosis if they get if they have bugs or, or if there's an issue with the soil and they have deficiencies, they, the app could could return a value as well. Oh, very cool. And and you you just answered one of what was going to be one of my other questions, and that is is the app free? So it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, it's a it's a premium app, so um, there's a free free part with just a 10 second ad, and then there's uh, a premium version uh, that's available as well. And that's the way apps are going, so that makes a whole lot of sense. It has always been. A, a challenge of mine through through the growing is the whole male female situation. So you're providing a male female scanner as well. Yeah, that's what the premium version. You'll have a, a male female scanner, and yeah, you'll be able to to take pictures, and it works in the same way. You just got to zoom in on the, on the the issue, and then our goal there is really to get it as early on as we can. So yeah, um, yeah, so you can get just, rid of them. Yeah, so so the, like we we want to have it so that it's better than the human eye, so that you really take the picture and you really the app knows and, and gets you that early on result so you can really get rid of those males. Oh, very cool. So what is the premium uh, app? How much is it? It's uh, $40, so thirty nine ninety nine Canadian. Okay. And that's uh, available for purchase on the app. I'm really curious about uh, taking a peek at it. And, and as my plants start to grow, I, I think it's going to be cool this year. Is there any other benefits for the average grower that you think they could get out of, out of using the app other than what you've identified so far? Well, it's just as soon as they start having problems, then, you know, they, they can take a picture. Then sometimes you just see a few little, little dots or issues on your leaf that, you know, it's not very clear what it is at all. So the goal is, is as soon as they would see anything, the app right there, they snap a picture, they get a result. Excellent job. It sounds like you've, you've done a great job in putting this together, Daniel. How, how big is Is it just you or, or you got a team behind you? Uh, my, it's just myself. Um, doing the, the marketing and the sales aspect. Uh, I, I have a friend that, that's work, that they, they own a, a mobile company, so they're doing our mobile app. Oh, nice. I had started making them, but it was too much work to you know, try to promote an app and build it at the same time. <laughs> so yeah. it's nice to be able to hand that off to them. Yeah. And they've done, I think they've done a great job as well with the mobile app. So, um, so yeah, that's, it's just, right now it's just me. There, there's no investors. It's, it's me and I, you know, I, we've got the app. They're, they're handling the app. Well, that's very cool. Congra- congratulations on getting it up and, and running. And it looks like it's going to be advantageous to a lot of people who are growing cannabis in our country. Yeah, I really hope so. So let me hit you with my hot seat questions, Daniel. So what's your uh, favorite cultivar? I would say it's uh, the green crack. I, I'm looking for something that's to pick me up, get me yeah. to, going to work. So um, that's one I, I've never... I, I had it, and then there's nothing else like it. So Yeah, that's um, nice. It's yeah. nice when you find that yeah. one that hits for you. Yeah, and exactly. And do you prefer joints or vape? Um, a joint. Okay. And uh, do you have a favorite munchie? Uh, I guess pizza's pretty good. <laughs> that's a pretty common response, so I'm not surprised yeah. by that one. Uh, edibles or flour? Uh, flour. Okay. Edibles is like they don't work until you you talk crap about them. They hit you too late. You know, you just take <laughs> them and you forget you took them. That's my thing with them. <laughs> That's a good description of it. I agree with that. Yeah. And now we're getting into some terminology issues. And and with you in New Brunswick, I really enjoy these. Uh, how things sound a little different across our country. Do you have a name, Daniel, for a running joint? A running joint? Yeah. What do you mean by running? So so uh, the the burn is running down the side of the joint. You're getting a what in in Western Canada is oh, often called canoe. a canoe. There you go. So a canoe yeah, is one. Yeah, it's canoeing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, white rabbit yeah, is comes out of Quebec, um, which was okay. one I hadn't heard white before. Um, wow, and then no, there, I never heard of that one. And then the other one that I find really interesting across our country, there's just slightly different terminology in in how people refer to three and a half grams of cannabis. Uh, how do you personally refer to three and a half grams? Yeah, I'd say three and a half grams. Oh. Yeah, I've heard an ace and yeah. Okay. But, Three and a half, yeah. Three and a half works for you, and and is that a fairly common phrase in, in New Brunswick where you are? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's a there's a slight variation again, and 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 I love the way our language is just slightly different across our country, and it's all about cannabis, and we're all passionate about this plant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a big, uh, a passionate cannabis industry in in Atlantic Canada. Um, there's a lot of people on LinkedIn right now that, you know, we got crystal cure and small little micros going out. It's very buzzing here. And it's, you know, I, I've been to a, a meeting, the, the New Brunswick Craft Cannabis Association. That was a while pre-COVID, but yeah. um, everybody's just there passionate and the you know, energy is amazing. It's, you know, 
it's it, it's it's people not they're not competing against each other they're not competing and helping each other so yeah. it's it's something really cool to be a part of and you know it's amazing to be at you know this time in in the cannabis times right yeah well and and I'm glad you shared your enthusiasm with it we've we've talked to we I talked with Tanner Stewart from Stewart Farms not too long oh, ago yeah, and yeah. and he had as much enthusiasm for what's happening out there as well so very cool Daniel I'm yeah. pleased to hear that New Brunswick is alive and well and, and cannabis friendly as well. That's very cool. Yeah, it is. Well, thanks for sharing your story with us. We will uh, post the details again at uh, CannabisPodcast.com where you'll find a link to Daniel's app and you can check out all the details for yourself. Daniel, I will leave it there. You enjoy the rest of your day, sir. All right. Thank you. You too now. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Cultivar Corner, Cultivar Corner, oh yeah. Cultivar Corner, please explain this stuff to me. On this episode of Cultivar Corner, we're heading back to the East Coast. We've been there before. (laughs) We've actually been to the East Coast a few times over the course of this podcast. Mm. And what I'm pausing to smell is another treasure from the folks at Highland Grow in Nova Scotia. And uh, what have we tried from them before? We tried Eastern Tank. That was really good. Apologize for that little click in the background. I'm actually rebooting my computer at the moment. (laughs) So we have tried Eastern Tank. Quite enjoyed that indica. And let me preface this discussion as well, that part of the uh, appeal, or at least the curb appeal of this particular cultivar is the THC. And I know, I know, I know, we've talked about it, and I have certainly talked about it a lot, that the high levels of THC is not the only thing we should be looking at when we're choosing our cannabis, or trying to pick which particular cultivar we want to have a taste of. And so what have I done here? Well, I've gone for the highest THC available. (laughs) And I did it actually kind of intentionally because I thought it would be a good experiment to see whether or not that simple high THC gives you the bigger bang that you're thinking it should. And I guess we're about to find that out. So let me give you the details. Gaelic Fire is a high THC indica dominant strain that exhibits flavors of gassy, citrus, and sour the buds that range from forest green to pale purple. Let's take a look at a couple of those buds and see what our evaluation of those colors are. Okay, yeah. That's a nice, pretty nice big bud. One side of it's kind of green, and as you turn it, there's some purple elements. So, yeah, they're correct in that. Now, the terpenes, not on the label. As we've indicated a number of times lately, where we are seeing them show up on labels, not so much from Highland Grow's uh, Gaelic Fire. No terpenes on the label, but they do have the terpenes on the website. And they are. And this doesn't surprise me. This is kind of what I expect when I'm looking at an indica-dominant hybrid. Myrcene is the number one terpene, followed by beta caryophylline pinene, and linalool. And all of those kind of make sense. And... I'm thinking from an indica perspective that that may be my, I was going to say my magic trio, but I guess there's actually four here. (laughs) The four musketeers? Is is that? No, I guess that doesn't work, does it? (laughs) So Gaelic fire is what we got. And here was the kick, as I mentioned before, the THC level. And this one, when it came back into the store, was the highest level of THC that we had in flower at the moment. Not pre-rolls, just in the flower. Are you ready? 27.1%. And on the website, they list the THC in this particular strain being from between 23 and 29%. Really? I got ripped off? I didn't get up to the 29% mark? I only got 27.1? What kind of a ripoff is this? (laughs) Okay, I digress trying to make a point, and now we're going to find out. Does the fact that there is this is the highest THC that's been in this room for the last couple of weeks, is it going to give me the bigger bang for my buck? Well, I'm not going to delay that explanation or that exploration any longer. I've got a joint. I have my lovely, delightful new crafty all loaded up with some herb, 
ready to show its worth from the vaporizer perspective. Let me turn it on so we know that it's going to be heated when we're ready. And in the meantime, here's the joint. The genetics, since I'm looking at the screen and right in front of me are the words genetics, if you're wondering what Gaelic fire, the cultivar, the lineage is, California Kush and purebred Afghani. Again, that says some pretty deep notes for a good indica, especially that purebred Afghani. So California Kush and purebred Afghani turns into Gaelic fire from Highland Grow in Nova Scotia. Now, as I let that first toke kind of settle in, the aroma notes, as I peek into the bag, definitely some spicy notes. Absolutely some spicy notes in there. Little of the floral from the linalool and a, and a lot of the earthiness from, from the mirror seam. Interesting smell. More importantly, What's the hit? Not a lot of taste notes in the flower. As I whip that joint up and prepare to inhale and consume as much of it as is physically possible. <laughs> Three tokes down. And well, there's the first sign. And there's the first indication that there's something going on. Is it as deep as I had hoped at 27.1%? Hmm. Not yet. But to make sure we get the full sensation, set the joint down for a bit. And what you may not realize is in the interim between what I said just a couple of seconds ago and what I'm saying now, a bunch of time passed. <laughs> Some stuff happened in the house, and uh, obviously I couldn't record because of all the noise that was going on. So I ended up finishing the joint, and now I'm ready to move on to the vaporizer. And I'm still kind of waiting. Let's see if this helps. Oh, as usual, as soon as you get the vaporizer going, oh, the taste is just so delightful. I love being able to taste my weed. And the problem is that I don't have a definitive enough palate <laughs> to be able to pick out all those wonderful notes. I hear I hear people doing reviews and talking about the, the raspberry notes and the vanilla aftertaste and, and, and all that. <laughs> yeah, I agree. See, that's my computer saying, I agree with you. <laughs> It, I I just don't I just don't have the ability to. It's not that I can't describe it if I actually could taste it. Because now I'm trying to think. Okay, so so uh, is there some peppery notes? Is there some is there some earthiness? And and I can't <laughs> I can't nail it down. I feel I'm I feel I'm letting you down here and not being able to. Ac accurately or adequately describe the taste sensation. Jeez, I hope it's because I don't have COVID and I'm losing my taste. No, I, well, I, I guess you shouldn't really joke about that these days, should you? In fact, I just found out that my son has gone into 14 days of isolation because he was around somebody who was tested positive for COVID. And that's a realization that it doesn't matter who you are or where you are. Uh, it's close. That's a bit of a digression. Now, maybe, maybe that digression is an indication that, that I am feeding a little something for this, but I gotta be honest. If high THC was really the kicker that's going to put me in my ass and just make me feel really, really stoned, I gotta say, I'm just not feeling that here with Gaelic fire. So I finished the joint. I'm now into my fourth or fifth hit off of the vaporizer. Mm. 
And yeah, I'm stoned. But I'm not wasted. That's what I was hoping for. <laughs> I was hoping to get wasted. Well, hang on a sec. That that last little hit on the vaporizer seemed to have been a maybe a triggering element or something. No. No, it's not it's not it's not going very deep. So is high AT is high THC what you should be looking for? As I've said before, it's really the combination now and now and I guess this is the part that really does surprise me and whether it's a disappointment, I'm not sure. But with myrcene, beta caryophylline, pinene, and linalool, which I kinda thought were terpenes that had a really good effect on me and a pretty fast effect on me. Maybe the percentages are different. Now, it doesn't say how, how much the percentage of terpenes in this particular cultivar is. But anyways, I think I have to come to the conclusion that Gaelic fire, in terms of being a really potent indica at 27.1% THC, kind of disappointed me a little. From the cannabis-infused studio in the clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And I'll finish off today with a story from way back. This is probably back from the mid to late 70s. My wife and I were living in Nelson at the time, which I think I mentioned previously. And Nelson has, and still does, have kind of a reputation as being a cannabis-friendly place. Well, <laughs> I can't remember the specific weed we were smoking on this particular night. But <laughs> it resulted in giggles. I mean, serious, serious giggles. It, it started off after we had smoked, well, maybe one or two joints. My wife has always been pretty much of a lightweight in terms of her THC tolerance, so it doesn't take much for her. As you know, if you listen to the podcast at all, it usually takes a bit for me. And back then, if I remember correctly, we were smoking weed that was likely from the Kootenays and likely wasn't heavily butted because we, we smoked a lot of... of leaf back then, if I, if I remember. But anyways, on this particular night, whatever the weed was, boy, did we get giggly. We were listening to some music and telling some stories, and I don't know whether I was exceptionally funny that night or, or not. <laughs> Probably not. But my wife, she just went absolutely giggle crazy. She couldn't stop. It, she couldn't stop giggling. And it was starting to bother her. She was starting to be worried because she couldn't stop giggling. And it had gone on for probably half an hour, 45 minutes at this point. She's still just giggling out of control. I mean, she can catch her breath, but she's giggling and giggling, and she just can't seem to stop. And I now am probably not enjoying the experience as much as I once was, because now I'm worried about my wife, who is, for whatever reason, so stoned that she can't stop giggling. Well, I think after an hour, we decided that we had to do something about it. So we went to the Kootenay Lake District Hospital in Nelson. This was probably about 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night. And again, this was in the mid-70s. So cannabis was, of course, illegal at the time. And when we went into the emergency room, they said, well, what's the problem? We said, well, my wife can't stop giggling. And they said, well, what started her giggling? <laughs> we kind of had to say that. No, we'd smoke some joints, and she just started giggling and literally couldn't stop. And now she was having trouble catching her breath. And, and this was still going on while we're in the emergency room. They, they, they gave her some oxygen, which I guess they, they felt was something that they needed to do, and that kind of settled her body down a little bit. And, and she started to, I guess, not be giggling quite as convulsively and, and quite as continually anymore. And... They said, well, there's really not much we can do for you. I mean, uh, here, I'll, I'll, we'll tell you what, we'll, we'll give you a prescription. And this was the mid-70s. And for anybody who lived in the mid-70s, uh, doctors at that time were given Valium out a lot. And that's what my wife was sent home with that night, to stop her giggles, take some Valium, which will put you into this dozy state. <laughs> now, I can't remember if she actually took the Valium, but I do know that after having been to the hospital for a while and being under the stress of all the medical people all around us, kind of the buzz was going off. She had lost her desire to 
giggle incessantly, and so the crisis was over. We left the hospital, went home. I think I smoked another joint, but I don't think I convinced my wife to. If you ever have any comments about something that I should talk about here on the Cannabis Podcast, please let me know, info at CannabisPodcast.com. Same thing if you think there's someone that should be interviewed on the show, please let me know. You can find all the links always at CannabisPodcast.com. And that wraps it up for episode 68 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Cannabis Podcast.